everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here, and it's back to G.I. Joe comic book reviews. I just had to get past Cobra Convergence to pick these up again, but we are returning to the G.I. Joe comic book series with issue number 27 of the Marvel Comics series. Issue 26 was part one of the origin of Snake Eyes, and we learned a lot about Snake Eyes in that comic book. We learned about his history in Vietnam and how he met his buddies Stalker and Storm Shadow. Uh, we learned that his family died in a car wreck. Uh, we learned that he had a twin sister. And we also saw how he became a ninja, studying with his old war buddy, Storm Shadow. Snake Eyes' time with the Arashikage ninja clan was a period of personal growth in his life, but that time came to an abrupt end when the leader of that clan, the Hardmaster, was assassinated, apparently by Storm Shadow. The B-plot of that issue involved a squad of Joes, including Mutt and Junkyard, Tripwire, and Torpedo, surveilling a cabin in the Florida Everglades that was the base of operations of Zartan and the Dreadnoughts. All of Cobra High Command was present in the cabin, including Cobra Commander, Destro, and the Baroness. Mutt's dog Junkyard went rogue and seemed to be leading Cobra back to the Joes, but instead he led Cobra into quicksand. Good dog. The cover of issue 27 has a dramatic and exciting scene with Storm Shadow kicking Snake Eyes off of a train with Scarlet and Wild Bill hovering overhead in the Dragonfly helicopter. This is similar to something that happens in the comic book, that, but the details have been altered to make a more dramatic cover. On the splash page there is a title, Snake Eyes The Origin Part 2 with the creative team of Larry Hama Script, Frank Springer Pencils, and Andy Mashinsky Inks. As is often the case with these comics, this issue starts with the B-plot, as we catch up with Cobra Commander, Destro, the Baroness, and Zartan sinking into quicksand. The Baroness and Zartan take shots at Junkyard, but they miss. Tripwire, Torpedo, and Mutt think Junkyard is leading Cobra right to them, so they are on the move. Further up the same trail, Firefly and Wild Weasel are setting a trap for the Joes. Destro uses a wrist rocket to knock over a tree so Cobra's entire command structure can extricate itself from the quicksand. I still think it's funny that all of the important officers in Cobra were together at the same time in the same place and they could have all died at the same time. Back at G.I. Joe headquarters, the pit, Scarlet, Hawk, and Stalker are piecing together Snake Eyes' known history. Hawk describes how they were able to find Snake Eyes and recruit him for the G.I. Joe team. After leaving Japan, Snake Eyes had retired to an isolated cabin in the High Sierras. He rarely returned to civilization, and the locals had a rumor he was a werewolf. Hawk and Stalker eventually find Snake Eyes' cabin, and in that cabin there is a wolf. Hawk asks if the wolf is Snake Eyes, which I think is funny. Of course he didn't believe the werewolf story, but when you show up at Snake Eyes' cabin and there is a wolf, it doesn't hurt to be sure. Stalker says, come on Snake Eyes, you've forgotten enough for one lifetime, it's time to go home. Snake Eyes doesn't seem too thrilled at this. Does he want to leave? Are they bringing Snake Eyes home, or are they kidnapping him from his home? Does Snake Eyes have a choice in the matter? They leave the wolf behind. The wolf is not named, but it's assumed this is Snake Eyes' wolf companion, Timber. An important part of Snake Eyes' lore is established here. Snake Eyes has always been closely tied to the wolf as if the wolf is his spirit animal. Scarlet takes up the story here and describes the formation of the G.I. Joe team and her job to conduct the hand-to-hand -hand refresher course for the Joes. Of course, the Joes, being jocks, don't think a woman can beat them up, so she teaches them lessons about that, starting with Steeler. Snake Eyes is next, but Scarlet quickly throws him and ends that lesson. Scarlet is an expert martial artist and has been most of her life, so it's not surprising when she notices Snake Eyes' skill level. He never loses control, and she can tell he's letting her win. This intrigues Scarlet, so she decides to get to know Snake Eyes better, and this is the beginning of the special relationship between Scarlet and Snake Eyes. The story cuts to one of G.I. Joe's first missions, which was a hostage rescue in a desert country. The G.I. Joe team was loaded into a pair of helicopters. Unfortunately, dust in the engine caused one of the helicopters to stall out. Some of the team was able to jump free, but Scarlet was stuck. 
The stalled out helicopter collided with the blades of the other helicopter and that caused the aviation gas to explode. Snake Eyes was able to rescue Scarlet, but the explosion destroyed his face and rendered him unable to speak. There are a couple things I really like about this sequence. First, all of the Joes are wearing the same uniform, and this is a throwback to those 1982 Joes that mostly looked alike. Even Snake Eyes and Scarlet haven't gotten their unique uniforms yet. This is an insight not just into Snake Eyes' history, but the history of the G.I. Joe team. Another thing I like about this is it's a historical reference to Operation Eagle Claw, which was one of the first missions of Delta Force. Delta Force was an inspiration for the G.I. Joe team. Operation Eagle Claw was a failed mission in 1980 to rescue U.S. hostages held in Iran and resulted in helicopter crashes. Snake Eyes could have quit the G.I. Joe team and quit the army at that point. He was disabled by this helicopter crash, and honestly, if he wasn't able to speak anymore, he probably wouldn't really have been given a choice on whether he quit or not, but somehow he was able to remain in the army and remain on the G.I. Joe team. The image of Snake Eyes on this page, in his army uniform, with his Arashikage tattoo, and with his face bandaged, tells us a lot about Snake Eyes' history. His bandaged face with the sunglasses may also be an allusion to the Invisible Man. Back in Florida, Junkyard safely springs Wild Weasel and Firefly's trap, which allows the two Cobras to be captured by the Joes. That's about the time the other Cobras show up and the shooting starts. Back in New York City, now that this story is nearly half over, we see Snake Eyes himself. In the previous issue, he was meeting with the Softmaster. The Softmaster recaps some of the information from Snake Eyes' ninja origin from last issue. The Softmaster warns Snake Eyes that Storm Shadow is watching them through the window and tells Snake Eyes to get him. So Snake Eyes fires his Uzi through the front window of the restaurant and out into the street. The gunfire causes panic on the streets, of course. What Snake Eyes just did is super illegal and very likely to injure or kill some random person. Storm Shadow jumps through the window and Snake Eyes continues his gunfight inside the restaurant. The cops show up, of course, to arrest Snake Eyes. They have no reason to arrest the other guy because even if Storm Shadow was peeking through a window, that's not quite the same as firing a gun into a crowded street. Snake Eyes follows Storm Shadow through a basement exit, and the chase is on through the streets of New York. Snake Eyes gets his Uzi caught in a street sweeper and loses it, which is fine. If you can't use it responsibly, you shouldn't have it. Scarlet intercepts the police report and deduces it must be about Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow. Good. Somebody go fetch that young man before he shoots up a bus stop or something. Storm Shadow and Snake Eyes continue their fight to the top of a train, with the Joes attempting to reach them in both the Vamp and the Dragonfly. We get some ninja fighting action on top of the train, which is pretty cool. That's exciting. I like that. Scarlet and Wild Bill in the Dragonfly catch up to the ninjas just as the train is about to go through a tunnel. Snake Eyes can see the tunnel, but Storm Shadow has his back to it. Storm Shadow reminisces about their time in Vietnam as the tunnel and the no clearance sign inch closer. Snake Eyes throws away his knife, prompting Storm Shadow to lunge at him. Snake Eyes falls backwards, pulling both ninjas between the cars, saving Storm Shadow's life. This scene shows where comic book timing and pacing can become a little awkward. There's a lot of dialogue and a lot of action in these panels, whereas in real time, they would have reached that tunnel entrance in a matter of seconds. There would not have been enough time for all of these things to happen. Storm Shadow recognizes that Snake Eyes saved his life and decides they're even now. Storm Shadow explains that he did not kill the Hard Master, some shadowy figure within the Cobra organization did. Storm Shadow joined Cobra in order to work his way up the ranks and discovered the identity of his uncle's killer. By the time Scarlet and Wild Bill reach Snake Eyes, Storm Shadow has vanished. The final panel is back in the swamp, where Cobra has lost track of the Joes, and Zartan says it's time to call out the Dreadnoughts. At the bottom of the page, next, enter the Tank Smashers. This is a pretty good issue, though not quite as good as the previous issue, as part two of the Snake Eyes origin. It spends quite a bit of time off of that topic. The story works best when it focuses on the history of Snake Eyes, 
And by telling the history of Snake Eyes, it gives us a bit of the history of the G.I. Joe team as well. Some important elements of Snake Eyes' backstory are established here, including where he went after he left Japan, his connection to the Wolf, how he was recruited for the G.I. Joe team. We are shown the beginning of Snake Eyes' connection to Scarlet. We now know why he always wears a mask and why he doesn't speak. The action in this issue is fine. The B-plot story in the Florida Everglades probably could have waited for another issue. Snake Eyes firing his Uzi into the street is a little bit ridiculous, but I liked the ninja fighting. That was pretty cool. I commend Frank Springer for his work on this issue. I criticized his artwork in a previous issue. I thought it looked a bit sloppy and unfinished, but this issue is much better. That makes me think his previous issue was a rush job, and when he has time to actually finish the paper, Pages, it comes out much better. I definitely recommend this issue for the Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow origin parts. Not as good as issue number 26, but still pretty good. That was my review of G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, issue number 27, written by Larry Hama and published by Marvel Comics. I hope you enjoyed it. I've got more vintage G.I. Joe toy and comic book reviews coming up, so please subscribe if you haven't already. I'll be back soon with a vintage G.I. Joe toy review. I really hope you like that one. I put some extra work into it. Until then, remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe.